Hi, welcome to Broken and Brilliant. I'm Carrie O'Toole with Carrie O'Toole Ministries. And today we're going to talk about um, a really interesting topic. I've invited my guest, my friend, Amy Van Tyne. Amy works with Rad Advocates. So welcome, Amy. Thank you. I'm excited to have you here. Uh, Amy, the way that this topic came up is I've actually got an intern working with me this semester, which is interesting. I've never Ooh, had that exciting. before. Yeah. Yeah. And Shelby is a senior in uh, undergrad, getting her degree in psychology, mm -hmm. and she needed an internship. So she called me up and asked if we could meet and talk about it. And, you know, with the topic that I deal with, like in yes. a daily basis, is adoptive parents who are in crisis and struggling with their children because the children have had so much early trauma mm -hmm. through no fault of the adoptive parents. You know, they, they adopted right. children that came out of a traumatic environment and now the trauma is wreaking havoc in their family. And mm -hmm. the topic came up around the idea of abuse from, from child to parent and also the idea around uh, children falsely accusing parents of abuse. Right. Right. And so I thought of you with Rad Advocates. Can you share a little bit about what Rad Advocates is and what they do? And then we'll get into this topic a little bit more. Sure, absolutely. So Rad Advocates is an organization where we support uh, caregivers, families who are raising children with reactive attachment disorder. And we help them to navigate the disorder, whatever that looks like for each family. So that could be just helping them set goals, safety plans, uh, locating appropriate therapists to helping them navigate our child welfare system, insurance systems, out-of-home placements, uh, things like that. And with that, it's interesting because uh, quite a few of our parents will come to us with cases open with uh, Department of Social Services for false allegations. So yes, this is, this is a topic that is one of the many complexities of this disorder in the web of trying to parent a child from trauma, for sure. Yeah, so let, let's talk just a little bit. I thought maybe instead of like me just interviewing you, how about we just have a conversation about this? Because we know each yes. other well, and yeah. uh, we run in the same circles and we've had similar experiences in our own lives and with the clients that we work with. So um, we do get clients, you know, I was thinking about this kind of the age of me too, the age of believe every person. If somebody says that there's an allegation, then as a society, we should just believe them. Right. And, you know, probably, I don't know what percentage, but a high percentage, that's true. We really Absolutely. should believe people. And so we're not right. saying, you know, doubt every person, no. but we happen to work with trauma and mm -hmm. a lot of traumatized people want to control their environments. Can you share a little bit about that with the kids? What goes on in these families where there might be allegations that are false? Right. Well, and I see it from many different angles as far as where the allegations can come from. A, a lot of times the false allegations, I think, come from previous memories or, you know, the body remembering certain right. feelings. Um, I was actually just having a conversation this morning with one of our members that I work with where um, we were discussing, you know, safety planning and, and when is her child trigger and what is triggering him. And we were able to identify by asking him to go to his room. And of course, children with this disorder want to gain control and create the chaos. So of course, he's going to refuse to go to his room. Uh, and so then, you know, she's still trying to maintain parental authority. And I said, go to your room and then guiding him to the room. And this happens all the time with so many parents. So then you're guiding them to the room and it could be something that's just a small hand, you know, on, on their back guiding them. But to a child who comes from trauma, that can feel like extreme abuse. You're in their space, they're already in fight or flight. 
you're touching them and that can be painful. And then of course they start screaming, you're hurting me, you're punching my back, you're trying to choke me, whatever it is. And I believe that sometimes the children really feel that way. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not able to distinguish the separation. Um, and, and then they can start reporting to, to mandatory, mandatory reporters. Right, right? because of family, yes. you know, church, whatever, you know, when they have the simple discussion of good touch, bad touch, you know, what's going on in your family? My parents hurt me. Um, and we see it to all levels. You know, my parent doesn't feed me. Right. Well, that's another big one. Well, they feed the child, but it may not be the donuts and pancakes and candy that they wanted for breakfast. And so that trauma response, again, from that early abuse or neglect or whatever their situation was, then sparks that for the child again of, I didn't have the food I needed then. So now I'm in deprivation, you're starving me, even though it's, it's just because sugar is not healthy for you type thing. Right, I, re I remember in a training one time they were talking about something called felt safety. And yes. that's, you know, we can tell a child they're safe all we want and we know they're safe, but if they don't feel safe, until they feel safe, they're not going to feel safe. And so even around food insecurity, if a child grew up with, you know, early years, had food insecurity or deprivation or whatever, uh, the meal could be placed on the table and we're, you know, you're still finishing off the final touches, the potatoes aren't done yet or whatever. Yeah. And the child sees the meal on the table, but they're saying they're starving. And they want something right now. And if you don't give it to them right that minute, you know, one of the trainings that I got was make sure they always have something so they can have it, even if the meal is sitting right there on the table or let yes. them get started early or whatever. But if you're not at a meal time and that happens right. and then they go to school or they go to church or they're on their team and you've got a mandatory re reporter, I was starving last night. And my parents didn't feed me. Feed me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Or the other thing that happens is, um, because yes, that makes sense. The solution to it is giving the child something that they can always have, you know, always have that bowl of fruit or something there. But part of with reactive attachment disorder that also comes into play to make it more complex is the child struggles receiving that food from you right. because as parents, we're giving it to them as nurturing them, as caring for them. And that's what this disorder is reacting to. So it's also very common that these children can't receive the food that we're providing for them. And so even though they have it in front of them, they may not eat it. Right. And then, then they're reporting that they didn't eat and they're starving. Um, or the other thing is they eat it, but then they go and eat out of the trash um, because that's what's comfortable to them. I know my child oftentimes would prefer to eat out of the trash than eat the meal that we provided for her. You know, and that to people that don't know this disorder, that sounds crazy. You know, right. I remember talking to an attachment specialist early on in our journey. And he said he knew of a child who actually was a biological child, but had had some medical trauma right yeah. at birth and was it, that created this reactive attachment disorder. Yeah. This child was convinced that his mother was trying to poison him. Mm -hmm. And so he would not eat anything that mom made. And mm -hmm. so they would go to a potluck or a, something at a friend's house for a party or something at church. And he would go and ask mom, what did you make? Uh, and not eat it. So he could eat everything else. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's just hard for people outside this world to understand that this right. outside of the world of reactive attachment disorder, you know, people in the, in this community, we get this, but trying right. to explain it to family or friends is really, really difficult. Um, you know, you talked cool. about allegations coming, stemming from possibly an earlier trauma memory, you know, it feels similar. So therefore they believe it is. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are also times, especially, and I've seen this with clients of mine reporting on kids who have been into a treatment facility of some kind. Oh yeah. 
And then they come home and all of a sudden they've picked up all kinds of new disordered behaviors that they didn't have before they left. They left and they were not cutting. They come home, now they're cutting. They left and they were not accusing falsely. Now they're accusing dad of rape or they're accusing a brother of rape, even a a 10 year old brother of rape. And they didn't even know about that before, but they come home and now all of a sudden they are. What is going on in that situation? Do you know? Well, I think a lot of it is, first of all, they will morph to whoever they're around, right? Rat is like a a chameleon. They're adapting to whoever they're around to uh, work on those services and goods. That's what their relationships are built on, services and goods, not connection. So they're morphing to who they're around. And in the residential setting, that's other children who have issues that need to be worked on, some healing. And so they will often morph to those people and then uh, take on their story as their own. Uh, A lot of rad children don't have a sense of self. They don't know um, their own identity, who they are. They lack that basic foundation of, of identifying themselves. So they morph to others, pick up their identity, and it also helps them um, now have a new tactic of how to get out of the home. This child's in the RTC because, you know, they're- Define RTC just real quick. A residential treatment center Mm -hmm. or, you know, inpatient hospital, something like that. Then, Then they can identify like, oh, they're here because their parent did such and such to them. And then they, now the disorder knows that that's another way out of the home. So when the child integrates back into the family, the disorder ramps up again and now needs to get back out of the house. And so usually the behaviors escalate. They'll either escalate um, on whatever it was the first time that got them placed into a treatment center, or they will start taking on the other stories or behaviors they picked up while in treatment because uh, they know that will get them out. And so they can- And let's explain, can... let's explain also for people who don't understand this disorder, it, that also sounds strange. Why would a child be trying to get out of their home? I mean, you'd think yeah. that the minute they were placed with other children, with no one they know in a medical type facility or a, an institution life- yeah. Why, why is that? Why do they feel safer in that environment than yeah. with their parents who love them? Right. Because there's no intimacy or connection in those facilities. You know, it's not genuine. It's yeah. uh, staff And this is, is an weak. intimacy disorder. Yes. It's yeah. about attachment and connection. Yeah. So explain also what you said real quick about services and goods versus the connection. Yeah. What does that look like? So based on their early development, all of their relationships were built on services or goods because there wasn't um, the opportunity, whether it's they're adopted or bio, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter for the disorder. There wasn't an opportunity in that early developmental stage to develop that firm, healthy attachment with with one primary caregiver. So whatever the circumstances were that developed the disorder. So their relationships are only built on getting a service or a good met. Because they learn not to trust adults in charge to meet their needs. Right, right. And that's one thing I I have seen many of my clients struggle with is they're recognizing their child truly does want this goods and services type Mm -hmm. of relationship, meaning I'll do this if you'll give me that. Yeah. What, how can I get you to give me this? I'll tell you, I love you. If you'll buy me the whatever, I'll I'll participate in family if I get this, Mm -hmm. but it's not out of a a, a true connection. Yeah. Right. And that's really hard for parents to understand, you know, and, and so we talk a lot. Well, it's also hard for the professionals to understand looking in. And so when there is that false allegation made, it's really hard for them to understand because these kiddos are usually really sophisticated in their ability to um, 
get their services or goods met through right. manipulation and triangulation right. because they had to be for their very survival. Yes. And so when a professional is hearing them talk about um, abuse that may be going on in their home, it's, um, it's pretty much believed. Well, and it's very convincing. And yeah. we're, as a society, we're not used to children no. Uh, we don't even understand that there are children who have been so traumatized that they are in constant fight or flight, Right. that they are constantly scanning the room to figure out how to get their needs met in whatever right. method will work. Right. And they are charming because they have to be. They have to be. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's very, very difficult for, you know, I went, I went through grad school and in counseling, and I remember asking questions all the time. Where are the classes on this? Yeah. When are we going to learn learning this? <laughs> where are we going to learn this? And oh, I remember at two different universities, I remember them saying, you might be able to get a class on that at the doctoral level. Yeah. And I thought, so you mean every single counselor, therapist that's out there, nobody knows anything about this. Right. They've heard about it, yeah, but yeah. they don't understand it. And especially if they go in trying to help children, you know, they go in with a very naive uh, view that I want to help hurting kids. And that's right. fantastic. But the we want them to help hurting kids. Yes, absolutely. But the therapy relationship yeah. is based on a trust relationship. And what therapists have a hard time understanding because a child can come in and, and schmooze really well during a therapy session. And they know exactly what that therapist needs. Like you said, they can be a chameleon. Yeah. So they come in and present as if they're taking everything in and how great that therapist is. And oh, thank you so much. You're helping me so much. Yeah. But they're, they're playing it. And the therapist right. and has a really care, hard time. Yeah. And when the caregiver is saying, this is what I'm seeing at home, the caregiver says it must be something with you because I see this child has trust. There's, you know, the child has trust for me. We have a great relationship. We're building a rapport. Right. And actually that- Without the understanding that the rapport has to happen with the, the parents first. Right. Not with the therapist, but with, Not the, with parents. the parents. Yeah. And so that's why many times parents of children with reactive attachment disorder are counts, are, are, recommended by people who actually understand this disorder to mm -hmm. not have the child go to therapy by themselves. The parents right. need to be involved as well so that the child can't triangulate, can't right. falsely accuse, can't manipulate the therapist because right. that ends up making the disorder even worse, worse. even though the yeah. therapists go in with every good intention. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. And, and you know, we live in a society where every child should have a voice. And absolutely, they should, and we should be hearing our children, but there is also a fine line where we should also be able to uh, listen to the parents. You know, when we take our children to the doctor for a physical ailment, uh, the doctor listens to the parents. What are their symptoms? You know, are they right. running fever? What are they complaining about? And they, they collect their information from the parent. Around mental health, they actually push parents out and they only ask the child, you know, yes. where, how are you feeling? And when you have a child that, again, doesn't have that sense of self, and, and a lot of these kiddos can't even identify their basic emotions, um, they're able to tell the therapist, you know, they could, they could make anything up and say right. that, but it's not genuine. And so it's not really helping the family heal right. and move forward. Yeah. When you talk about that, not having an identity, I, I remember hearing from a therapist one time, why does this child like stare at the mom all the time? Mm -hmm. And the therapist said, because through age three, that child didn't have the normal development, which child development books talk about this all the time, that, it, that a child will, you know, they cling to mom for Absolutely. the first year to two years, and then they start getting down, but mom's always that home base, that safe yes. place that they can come back to. They get down from mom, go play, but as soon as mom comes back, they run. They're so excited to get back to yeah. mom, they can't stay down for too long. They have to keep coming back. 
that fills them up. These kids didn't have that. And so she said, this child doesn't even know who they are. Right. If mom's not in the room, they constantly stare, exactly. you know, through movies, the child will stare at mom rather than stare at the movie mm -hmm. to, to know that they exist. Like I don't even exist outside of this human, but yet it's such an anxious connection that, you know, that doesn't make them feel good. That doesn't make them right. feel secure at all. Right. You know, I, I just think this is such an important topic because it sounds like it's not even real and it sounds like parents are making this up or that, you know, there's these awful abusive parents who are doing right. these horrific things, but these parents are us and they're our clients. Mm -hmm. And these are not horrific parents. No, no, they're not. And, and the reality is too, is we want to have these discussions and we want to bring light to it, not because we want to say the abuse isn't real, but we also want to prevent abuse. Uh, right. Because if we're not having these tough discussions about what it's like to parent a child with reactive attachment disorder, and we're not creating awareness around it, we are creating more stressful environments in the home. And, and that could potentially lead to abuse. Right. Or, and also families feeling so isolated, yes. and not supported. And, um, and when they are looking for help and it's not available to them, then potentially, you know, we are setting some children up. Right. To where, and, where they're and as you're talking about that, it may be triggering a memory of prior abuse. Yes. That is being identified as being current right. and we want that abuse to be healed as well so we need Absolutely. to understand where is where is the abuse from we yes. have to be able to deal with that are the, is the child safe in the home right now or right. is this prior abuse right and we need to be able to understand and direct, differentiate between the two right and then as a as our systems you know it's it's hard to narrow that down because our child welfare system is responsible for protecting our children and we need them we need a child welfare system but it also comes to the point where you know they need to check off boxes and cover themselves legally so if they're looking at a situation like this where it feels so awkward and behind, you know, like what is going on here? You know, the child says, the mom says the child's not bonded, not attached. The therapist says the child is, the, the child has trust with her. I go into the home, there's lock on the refrigerators, holes in the wall. All the other kids have these, you know, toys in their bedrooms and beautiful rooms. And then this one child with this disorder has nothing they have to protect and and so they do have to open cases because they're liable to make sure that the child's well-being is is safe and um and then it gets really tricky after that of yeah of, share a little bit about what rad advocates does on behalf of some of these parents if there is a case filed right case filed. so it's always so much easier for everybody involved if we're um if we're actively participating early on, um, because we want to get in there and we want to help create the narrative of what's going on in the home, being able to explain it um, from our perspective. It's, it's viewed very differently when you have an advocate on there with you explaining the disorder as a third party versus the parents doing it. Because at this point, the parents are already being looked at as... Right what's going on with you, right? And child welfare is about parent reform. And so they're, they're going, okay, you're trying to explain this to me and it makes no sense. Clearly you need more parenting classes. Having a rad advocate on with you, we can say the exact same thing that the parent is saying, but we're looked at differently because we're a third party professional now at the table. So hopefully we can intervene early enough to help be a part of the team. We really wanna collaborate with child welfare. We are not against them at all. We admire these people who have the heart to get paid pennies to deal with hard situations. You know, They are really out there for the best interest of the child. And so we wanna work with them to help bring the family to a sense of stability um, because the reality is, is a lot of our families aren't stable. Right. You know, we're, we're not. We're, 
we're going through really hard times. So we want to be a part of the team to help bring stability, utilize the resources that social services may have that are effective. However, not very many of them are uh, due to the disorder. Right. But to help educate on that and say, okay, how can we work together as a team and, and bring about safety for this family and, and really offer education on the disorder. So hopefully all the adults are on the same page and working towards the family's best interest. You know, Amy, you said two things in your description of why social services or child protective services may see something in a home and go, hmm. And I just mm -hmm. want to give you a chance to share a little bit more about why a parent might have a lock on a refrigerator, why there might be holes in the walls, and why a child might not have all the things in their bedroom when their siblings right. do. Right. Well, the holes in the wall are typically from the child raging. You know, like we talked about earlier on this, on our talk was, you know, they're always in fight or flight. So those children who are in fight mode, they are going to be raging and they can be pretty destructive in their rages. So yeah, they, they could have holes in the wall, which also leads to safety issues. Um, it, you know, if they're in their room and they want to self-harm or they want to harm somebody else, there's a lot of items in a room <laughs> that can become dangerous. I had no idea until I parented a child with Rad what could be used as a weapon. Um, heater vents became weapons, curtain rods, um, board games. I mean, the things that became weapons was shocking. Um, and so for our safety and her safety, a lot of the things had to be removed from the room. Right. And what about so the lock very, on the refrigerator? Yeah. And the lock on the refrigerator, a lot of times that's because they're getting up and they're, they're gorging themselves. So we understand that children from trauma want to hoard food. And that's, that's one thing. And um, again, depending where the child is at on the spectrum and their severity, some children, you know, for my daughter, we had a drawer in her room that we would allow her to hoard her food. You know, she always had food in there, but when it becomes an issue is when it's, you know, food that's going bad and then you're starting to get rodents and bugs and then it really becomes a cleanliness issue. Or uh, my daughter didn't have this problem, but some children will gorge until they're sick and it really is unhealthy for them. And so having to put a lock on the refrigerator to maintain their health and their well being. Yeah. And these are just things that, you know, the typical public doesn't yeah, understand. No. No, no, because if you have a child from trauma that, and, and really how a lot of social workers will perceive it is, yeah, I understand this child um, was deprived food from early on and they starved. And, and so why would you lock food from them now? Like you're, you're abusing them. You're contributing. You're locking, yeah. You're contributing to their abuse again. Uh, but what they don't understand is that that piece where they don't know how to stop. They don't have that sensor to tell them that they're full. They don't have an understanding that there's, you know, an unlimited supply of food in the refrigerator and it will always be there when they're hungry. Well, and even things like soda or something like that, you know, if you had a six pack, they could down the entire six pack. Yes. And yes. so you have to lock some things up because they eat the entire package or drink the entire thing. Yes. And, uh, you know, you're allowed one cookie, but you're not allowed the entire bag. Right. And they, they can't sometimes have the control over that. Yeah, they don't. They can't regulate themselves. Right, right. Yes. Um, what about child on parent abuse? Have you seen this? Where, how Absolutely. often does this happen? What, what does it look like? Well, I think if we you know, really want to start talking about what is abuse, right? I mean, there's physical abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, spiritual abuse, financial abuse, there's all kinds of abuse. And so just in, in my example there, of everything in the room becomes a weapon. That is abuse. Now, this is where it's super complex because as parents, we definitely have an understanding of why our child's behaving this way. Right. You know, we, we can identify. 
And compassion and empathy. And compassion and, and empathy. We can identify my child's triggered. They're triggered by our love. And so I'm going to continue just to keep loving. I'm going to be consistent and, you know, show that eventually maybe the child will be able to receive love. But what happens is, is it really becomes that abusive cycle, right? We have where it doesn't matter who the person is, we're all human. And so abuse affects us all the same way, whether you're six months old or 80 years old, abuse is abuse. We all perceive it the same way, even though we might have a more of a logical understanding of why we're being abused. So just because it's our child who is being physically aggressive with us does not mean that it's not abusive and that our bodies don't respond the same way. So we start walking on eggshells, right? The cycles of abuse, you know, there's so many things out there. There could be one that there's six cycles of abuse or whatever. We're just going to go with the basic. There's walking on eggshells, the explosion, and then the honeymoon. Those are the stages of abuse. And that's what our children do. You know, we're, we start walking on eggshells because if we're too intimate with them or we have too many expectations of them, then they explode, they become dysregulated. And during that explosion, who knows what we're going to experience? Um, I, you know, I see myself and as well the families that I've worked with, that explosion can be pretty scary at times. And then of course, this is your child that you love and you're trying to protect them. So what do we do as parents? We interject, right? So if your child is raging and throwing things or um, threatening to jump out the window or- Or threatening to harm you or, or another threatening child. Threatening to harm you yeah. with, you know, something, a lamp or whatever, or your other children in the home, you know, you're gonna intervene. And oftentimes it gets physical. And, and then it happens, you know, usually the child will eventually calm at some point, they will rage themselves to exhaustion. Um, some last longer than others. I know my child could go hours. And then at the end, they finally, they're exhausted. And then as parents, you have that heartfelt connection. How many times have we all done that? Like, wow, you were really angry and what was going on for you? And, you know, next time, where can we like think back to where the trigger was and where can we insert coping skill, whatever one you want to insert. And we do this of like, how can we change this pattern? And the child may appear to be receiving that from us. Like, yeah, okay, yeah, next time I'll breathe or next time I'll hit my pillow. And so we think we're having like this honeymoon phase, right? Like, okay, maybe this is it. And then maybe for 24 hours, we don't have any behavior. So we think, okay, this is working. And we go into that honeymoon phase. And then it start, the cycle starts over because as long as we're not healing the disorder, then we're walking on eggshells. And the more it happens, the more in that cycle we get as parents. And the harder it is to get out. And it, the harder it is to get out. And not only as parents, but also the other siblings in the house. And so pretty soon we're all living in a domestic violence situation where everybody's walking on eggshells, waiting for the next explosion. Then the explosion happens and everybody's you know, traumatized by it. And then the honeymoon happens, but every honeymoon, you get less and less trusting that this is it and, and you're walking on eggshells. And then that becomes another barrier when trying to heal this disorder. Right. So a professional working with a family who's stuck in this domestic cycle of abuse won't understand um, even if the child with RAD is making incredible strides in healing the professional may not understand why the family isn't willing to believe that. And that's because they're still walking on eggshells waiting for the next explosion. Right. And believe that it's just a honeymoon. That's not true. Right. Oh, that's so good. Wow. Yeah. This is, like I said, this is a deep topic. It's a hard <laughs> topic. It's a complex oh. topic because there's not just a one size mm -hmm. fits all either. Like no. you said, rat is a, is a spectrum, spectrum. disorder. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not all children are violent. 
No, there, there are but some it, children but again, who are very emotionally manipulative. Right. And so it doesn't necessarily, yeah, doesn't have to be just the physical abuse. It could be the emotional. Yeah, and you know, truly, I did some crisis response training, and we were learning about what happens in the brain with PTSD and things like this. And um, they actually did talk about the difference between one incident of trauma, say a car accident or house fire or something like that. Um, the difference between that and a domestic violence situation. Because in the first situation, as horrific as that is, and nobody wants to experience that, no. you go home to where you're safe, and the majority of people, 80%, will never develop PTSD, PTSD because right. their body right. just can heal over that a, a few weeks it may take yeah. to come out or of that. But, yeah. Yes, but when, when you're, the eggshells thing is so good, as a visual, because, um, you know, when you have that first time and your body does the fight or flight and you're experiencing, ah, you know, you're flooded with stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline. And like in a car accident, it may take right. three weeks or so for that to calm down in a domestic violence situation. You get triggered like that. All the hormones are flooding before you can even calm down. Another one happens. And pretty soon over time, you just get stuck in that flooding place, right. which is PTSD. Exactly. And so now you've got a traumatized child who is reacting to attachment in a disordered fashion. Right. And then that triggers the parents who are now traumatized from those behaviors. So and now reactive. everyone is in a reactive yeah. place and it's a really right. difficult thing to heal especially within a home when everybody's traumatized. Well, absolutely. And then how you were using, um, you know, the, the car accident as an example, but then the next level of that is if you were in a car accident and you experienced that trauma, there's first responders there to help you, right? We go to doctors and everybody knows how to respond yes. to that car accident. And so then another level of trauma, and this will be a whole nother topic. For let's another let's do another day. one on this, but yeah. But the, then the next level of trauma is then this is happening in your home and you're going to seek help. So you go out to the outsiders. You, you think, okay, we're going to go family therapy. We're going to finally get, you know, get this access wraparound services, whatever. And then those first responders that you're going to for help have no idea what you're living with. And then and blame you, for it. you kind of get blamed. Yeah. And even if they don't outwardly blame you, there is some the attitude. Some, yeah, there is some yeah. unspoken presence there that lets it be known that, it, that yeah. if you could just change your parenting, this would go away. And so then that is creating more trauma. Yeah. You know, I want to give a quick example of um, just how, how the responders can help. And it's a totally different scenario. But a couple of years ago, my husband broke his hip while we were skiing. And, you know, he got put into the, the uh, ski patrol came down and picked him up, put him in the sled, yeah. got him down to the bottom. We recognized what was happening and he was going to need to go get surgery right then. And so they took him by ambulance to go get surgery. And I'm sitting there with all of our ski gear. I'm in boots because we've yeah. been skiing. I've got all by of his yourself. clothes, all of his stuff. And they sent somebody to pick me up and take me back to my car. And I said to the woman, I said, I'm a crisis responder. And I can tell I need a crisis responder because <laughs> I can't even think what to do. I can't and she what talked to me next. through, she, she knew, she's like, okay, tell me where you're staying. Where is your car? He, mm -hmm. She handed me written instructions to get to the hospital. She talked me through what I was going to do when I got back to where we were staying and that I needed to get something to eat and grab extra clothes and bring this, this, and this to the hospital. She talked me through it, but I was right. thinking right now with this next topic that we'll go into on the next podcast is what would I have done if she blamed me for it and left me standing there? Right. Because that's what a lot of our parents are dealing with. Right. And that's where we come in as rat advocates yeah. of so how do we help you? Yeah. Yeah. And that was the question is where do parents go for help? Where can they find you, Amy? We are at radadvocates.org and we have uh, memberships. 
So if you go to, I'm not sure if it's the join page or support, I'm not very tech savvy. I don't, don't know our page. You're good in other things. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, if you go to redadvocates.org, you can look through there and you'll find our membership page. And then you can join a membership. And you have different levels, correct? We have different levels because obviously this disorder is, uh, <laughs> there's all different levels to it. So yes. yeah. Some people know. just need a little coaching. Some yeah. people need somebody to maybe yeah. sit in on a meeting or something yeah. like that or advocate for them in a specific Absolutely. situation. And some people need more long-term, really Complete intense. crisis. Yeah. yeah. Obviously yeah. our goal is to reach everybody before extreme crisis, but that doesn't always happen. Right. So, yes. Right. Yeah. And I just wanted to say that here at Cario Tool Ministries, we have coaches for people going through this kind of stuff. In fact, sometimes we have people working with both of us because yes. we help more on the emotional, psychological, spiritual yeah. um, intervention piece. You yes. guys do the practical more steps than navigating, yes. navigating how to get through it. And we help you through the grief and the trauma of walking through this, but we also have um, coaches that can help with your other siblings, with what this does in your marriage, all of those kinds of things. So go to carryotool.com as well if you're looking for some help. But Amy, I just wanna thank you so much and I wanna invite you back. Let's continue. Yeah, absolutely, I always love chatting with you. <laughs> well, we could go on and on. So we'll, yes. we'll cut it here and we'll join up again another time to talk about some of those things further. So Amy, Wonderful. thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And we'll see you back here next time on Broken and Brilliant.